Okay, folks, we are here at the Barn Theatre and we've just been to see a very, very short extract from the technical rehearsal. Uh, I am here with Hal Chambers, Councillor Paul Hodgkinson, Aaron Sidwell and a load of local school children. Um, first of all, I just want to say, Hal, um, that looked absolutely epic what we just saw in the theatre. Talk us through what, what the guys just saw. So we've been practicing for the Siege of Harfleur, um, which is a, a, a sort of a, a battle that's been going on for a few weeks. Uh, Henry's troops, the English troops, are trying to take uh, a town uh, in northern France, and it's been really, really tough. And they're going one more. They're going one more time. So we have this famous speech, once more unto the breach, dear friends. And we've plotted an entire sequence where they have to climb up the sort of battlements into the town. And there's a lot of um, pretty crazy dance music. There's a lot of... there's a about a hundred cues in about five minutes um, of, of of various bombs and and things going off um, and a projection. Uh, so it's it's one of the hardest bits in the show, and um, but hopefully it'll be really really winning and it will get you into the real heart of how scary it would be to be in a real firefight, like a modern firefight um, with um, bullets flying over your head and you know it's a real genuine peril that uh, Henry and his crew are going through. Um, so we want people to feel that intensity, I suppose, and hopefully it's um, it's visually quite fun, uh, especially when they climb up uh, into the sort of heart of the war. Right at the end, they go over over the top, as it were. And Aaron, how does it feel to be actually doing it on the stage? Uh, incredible, so empowering um, to turn around to eight people amidst this firefight and go, "Come on, it's good fun." And we had a chat with. Um, uh, a seasoned soldier um, who's so high up and one of the things that he said that really stuck out for me that I've brought into that speech was after a while you just enjoy the crack of it you just enjoy the, the, the fun of being in and amongst that and so for Henry who is a seasoned soldier to be able to kind of play in the middle of this battle that this is kind of what he lives for this is FA Cup final day for him <laughs> like it's, uh, it, it's, it's actually really fun to play and as you can probably hear, anyone who's watching or the guys who just watched, this is totally different from a normal Shakespeare. Paul, you just watched uh, a little bit. You're a seasoned Shakespeare watcher. Uh, you've just been to the RSC uh -huh. last week. Yeah. How does this differ from what you expected here at the Barn Theatre in Sirencester? It, it, was, it was really different, actually, because first of all, it's a much more intimate sort of theatre. So if you go to the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford, it is so much bigger. So everything's bigger. But I guess with this, it was full on. That's how I would describe it, full on. You know, the battle scene was full on. The music was full on. The acting was full on. So you, you're kind of sitting there, kind of going like that. And I'm guessing that if, you know, for a full performance, you're going to walk out going, wow. It was different. It was really different. That's the plan. And do you think um, the the question that's going around at the moment is whether Shakespeare is relevant for these guys, and whether it should be studied in school, and and whether it's difficult to get young people to actually not just enjoy Shakespeare but to engage with it and take it further, yeah. um, whether it's as um, people who love literature or whether they want to be young actors, and if it is something that really is fun to do. Do you think Shakespeare is important in today's day and age? It is important, but it has to be seen to be relevant because I said earlier that when I was at school, I found Shakespeare incredibly boring. I have to, I'm really honest about that. I studied Macbeth, found it boring. Um, so it has to be brought to life. It has to be brought to life in a modern setting, I think, which, of course, this, this is what this performance is doing. And you have to, it has to be relevant. So if people see it as relevant, they understand it better, then they connect with it. Um, because Shakespeare's got so much that's relevant to today, all the power struggles, the love affairs, the tragedies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's all relevant to any any time, I think, and any person's life. And how um, the challenges of this production in particular? Um, what have you done with this to bring it to become relevant? So Henry V is a story about how a young English king decides that he needs to make his mark on the political European stage. So he um, you know, decides that uh, England is going to have some serious conflict with France and tries to invade it. And I think there's some really, <laughs> it's quite a topical moment where we have little England striding out in Europe and saying, hey, we, you know, we're, the, we're the big boys, we don't need you anymore, we'll do what we want. Um, this idea of empire that's still kind of very much ingrained in our blood, we are this incredible force and we, we want to do it our own way. Um, and for me, 
um, the um, the play really reflects some of those negoti negotiations we're going through at the moment. The idea of these growing pains that we're going through as a nation, and there's the rise of the right, which is happening across um, you know the country and Europe at the moment, which I'm finding slightly you know a little bit scary personally as uh, uh, myself. Um, but as an artist, this isn't about us. You know, I don't think this is a particularly uh, full-on lefty production, but it is definitely a provocation. What happens when you put a, uh, a young king with lots of patriotic language, which is quite violent sometimes, at the forefront of a nation? Well, this, we have a conflict. Mm. So this this language is just, you know, potentially nationalistic in the play. Um, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, little England, uh, once more for, uh, you know, King Harry and all that stuff. Mm. Um it becomes a little bit more dangerous now um, when you put it in, you know, when you're flicking through the news and you see Nigel Farage and you see Tommy Robinson. Scares me a little bit. Um, but at the same time, Henry's a much better guy <laughs> than they are. And it is also, you know, a chance for us, the audience, to be the jury. You know, is Henry a good king or not? He does some terrible things. Um, and we're just putting all of those, um, all of those choices and things that he has to go through on stage. And the audience got to decide, is this guy this guy a national hero a national treasure or was he a terrible terrible man so and you're leaving it there for them to make that decision yeah so the setting yeah absolutely the setting is 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 a kind of a shakespeare land version of what 2019 looks like so we have the negotiations between the english and the french kind of falling apart um we have the full-scale battle scenes and at the end we have union of sorts between England and France. But that union, we are told by the chorus, who's a character in the play, does not last and England bleeds. I just hope England isn't bleeding right now. Oh, I believe in England, I'm very patriotic. Um, but I, I feel like there's, people just gotta get along. You know, We gotta understand each other. We have to, as Catherine says at the end of this play, receive each other, listen to each other. And that's what the play's about for me. Mm. It's a conversation. Mm, absolutely. and. Um, Aaron, you're actually saying a lot of these provocative words, these epic, epic speeches. Uh, how, how have you interpreted them? Um, I think it, there's every speech it, it can have the same feel about them with Henry, but um, one of the things that Hal and I have discovered together is actually the difference in, in, uh, in how he speaks to people uh, throughout the play. And we, and we sort of categorise him in three ways of Henry... Harry and Hal, and at, at various times within those speeches, he, he sort of flits in and out of these different personalities of who he almost wants to be, who he once was, and who he thinks he should be. And uh, approaching it from that point of view, I can, I mean, every actor has to sympathize with, with the person that they're playing because otherwise they can't play them effectively. And so I do see from his point of view how he gets to these certain places. They're not choices that I would make. But uh, then again, I'm not king. so You are in my <laughs> world. <laughs> <laughs> I should be. Um, <laughs> but how... I think the interesting question is when you take a very normal man and put him in that position within his 30s, uh, how are you going to deal with that? And, and, and yeah, I don't know how I would. And so I think we see how Henry does. And I think he makes a lot of mistakes. And unfortunately, when you're king, your mistakes are pretty huge. Mm. Mm. Uh, just to butt in there, I mean, Henry is a, d a leader who at least makes some decisions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Unlike yeah. the Queen of France in this play, who dithers, and you might see a little bit of Theresa May in that character. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what are you your know, thoughts on that? We've got to make decisions as well, a country right now. Yeah, right, and I, I, think, I think there's a terrible gap in leadership at the moment. I mean, and I, and I count all parties in that, including my own, as, you know, there, are, there doesn't seem to be any inspiration there. Um, it's, it's almost kind of bureaucrats moving stuff around or fudging things, and that's very sad. So people are sort of almost looking for strong leaders, and then when they find a what they think is a strong leader, like a Trump, obviously I'm not in favour of Trump, but he might be perceived as strong, or a Farage character, they then cling on to those people, and that's what I think is dangerous, because some of the rhetoric coming from people like that is far right and populist, and c it's very potentially very dangerous. So we have to fill the gap of that leadership with something better. So I'm, I'm looking around for, for inspiration myself, you know, as, as, a, as a local leader. So who, who are we in the audition process? We had this whole conversation with every, every person who walked into the auditions. Who are the leaders in society today? And actually, I'd quite like to ask you guys that. So if I can hand, hand the mic over to someone, who, who do you look up to who is a leader 
into today. Don't in all jump world. at once. <laughs> <laughs> Reed, Reed, why don't why don't you grab the mic for a second? So, who do you look up to in society these days? Is it is it Theresa May? Um, not particularly, no, not for <laughs> me. <laughs> um, not in any political way. Um, but I look up to m- more people closer to myself rather than in in England. So I rather I look up, look up to my parents and peers and and people like that rather than. Uh, people up in people higher up in society, but yeah. Great, uh, Amelia. Do you, do you have any thoughts on that at all? Um, I think it doesn't really matter how much power you've got in a country, but if you're not using it for good or using it to affect lots of different people positively, then the people that are actually doing that and changing people's lives should be the people that you look up to, rather than just someone who's ended up in power. <laughs> Great, and Amelia, if you could ask a question to any of these guys, now's your opportunity. Um, Aaron. I was wondering how, um, with text that's essentially Elizabethan, how you've managed through your acting to portray the modern themes inside of it. Oh, I'll go here. <laughs> um, so, uh, obviously, Shakespeare wrote uh, with the meter, so there's there's a rhythm to how uh, the, the play is written. And actually, um, I think that studying anything classically, whether it's piano, guitar, text like this, is is actually where you find all the ability to then go on and perform anything that's kind of current. Like if you if you can play classical piano, you can play any pop song standing on your head. It's kind of the same with this. So in terms of approaching this, uh, Shakespeare told us exactly how he wanted us to act it. Uh, and um, a lot of the language is similar to uh, ha- how we how we talk now and I think the difference in reading a play of Shakespeare's and, and and watching a play is that when you read it it looks foreign but when you hear it you go no 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 that's that's my that's my language that's the language that I speak now um, and so there is where you is where you get the clues and and I would always encourage someone who wants to know what a Shakespeare play is about to go and watch the Shakespeare play don't this was this wasn't a book. It wasn't meant to be read. So yeah, kind of in that regard, I've watched a lot. Yeah, the idea of academia in Shakespeare's times wasn't, wasn't a thing. People never studied Shakespeare. They never <laughs> studied plays in this way. Plays were like a live art form, and you know, there d- d- people would just be laughing at it. It's a bit like would you go and read a f- uh, the Game of Thrones script back? You might do. You might go and read the, a film script. No, you're going to go and watch. You know, Avengers. Right? You're not going to go. Hey, go read this. It's weird, right? So it's exactly the same with Shakespeare. So if you don't, if you feel like you're struggling with it, either get it up and act yourself, or just go and see a really good production of it, and and then it will appeal to the human heart, not to the brain. And that's how you know. I think we've been approaching this. Is like, just don't faff around with this flowery language. Get down to it. Get down to the real business of it. Like, what are you saying? Why? And why does it matter? And and then it's really it's really fun. How was it to like? How was the modernisation of this old-fashioned play? How did you take that on and make it appeal to almost everyone who came to see it? How did you want to make that more modern? Um, remarkably, it's actually, in, as, as Hal kind of said, it's actually a very modern play, um, as I think a, a lot of his are. Um, so I think the fact that we've, the fact we've modernised it, it almost feels like this is when it was intended to be written for... Um, but in terms of how we've uh, approached a leader like a king going into battle now, I think has been quite interesting. We've spoken a lot about, as you were saying, who are the leaders of today. Um, I think a leader is just anybody that inspires you. And I, I, I'm i a big football fan, as is my wonderful director here. Both massive Arsenal fans. Great. Um, so we got on well. Uh, <laughs> and a lot of the people we spoke about were football managers. That they, you, the ability to motivate multi-millionaires to run through brick walls for you, to put their bodies on the line, to, 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 to get the absolute uh, maximum from them. They are incredible, inspiring motivational speakers and so we looked a lot at that element about how how do you appeal to these people how do they talk to these people how do they and 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 one of the things we've really found through having less actors on the stage as well is that a lot of uh 
Prince Hal's friends are there with him, and and not just Harry's sort of subjects. He he he's able to speak to these people as people, and I think that um, that has a really modern feel to it because I think that if I was seeking to motivate people, hopefully they'd be people that already knew me, and then I'd know how to talk to them specifically. So it's kind of that's that the speeches have kind of yeah. got that. In them. I think, ha, ha, yeah, uh, ha, Harry really understand or gets to understand his his people really, and there's a, a pretty close um, relationship between England as a nation and him as a, polit- a political leader, and at a time where it feels like there's a you know Westminster and the people feel like they're drifting away from each other. This play is a really nice reminder that there can be this symbi- symbiotic relationship between the two. Uh, And just another thing about how it's modern. I think it it feels modern because when Shakespeare first wrote these plays, he's writing in a place called the Globe Theatre, where uh, rich people all the way down to the poorest members of society in London came. So he always has to write stuff that appeals to everybody, like from the start. So I think that's why they're still popular, because he wasn't just writing, you know, high art. He was, like, writing silly jokes and, and dances and all sorts of things. He had to make it really entertaining, you know? So that's maybe why they're still so popular today and feel really modern because they're appealing to like the humanity, the sense of humour, you know? Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, one last question and then we've got a wrap. And I'd like, uh, Hayden, you've got a question? Great. When you were younger, do you believe watching a play like this um, would give you a better understanding of Shakespeare and his other plays? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, this the history plays, because obviously this is... A lot of it is dramatized, but a lot of this stuff took place. The battles that you see in this took place. Um, there's a really deep rooted element there uh, within, you know, history for us, and and how we've developed to be the nation that we are now is as a result of what what kind of came before, which is you know, which is what we're doing in this play. So. Um, you know, any war movie that you want to stick on and, and watch that you find entertaining in a, in a, in a modern context, this this play's got it in there. I mean, the in that tiny tiny little stage that we can do phenomenal things in, thanks to the Barton Theatre and their wonderful technology here. Um, Carry on. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, we we've created battle sequences and, uh, and and language through this that, that you would see or you'd struggle to see in, in, in movies now. It's so, it's so, so, so epic that I can't imagine anyone will come and watch this and will walk away and go, not for me. Shakespeare's not for me. They'll walk away from this and go, I want to read Henry VI part one after this or yeah, I want to go back next, and, yeah. and read Henry the fourth mm. part one and part two and Richard the second and yeah. it, it's it's all this is part three really of a trilogy or maybe even part four you know it, it just like this it, it's all it's all connected it's it's so um it's so entertaining that I just cannot see anyone walking out of the theater and and not wanting to go and see it go and see another Shakespeare play Paul how how does it feel seeing young people, um, professional creatives, um, m- you know, Mr. Aaron Sidwell from EastEnders, Aaron Sidwell here <laughs> in Sirencester, um, engaging with not just Shakespeare but in theatre, in culture, in history, yeah. um, and seeing it all, you know, come to life not just in Sirencester but seeing young people be inspired by all of this. Re- well. Really good, really good. I think, you know, the Barn Theatre has, you know, really filled a gap that we had locally because in Sirencester, it's a relatively small town and often we've looked to other places, Cheltenham or some people look down to Swindon, they look to Bristol and Birmingham and Oxford. But we don't need to do that now because we've got a very special theatre here and it's cutting edge and I really do mean that. And I've been to see a number of performances here and I think this one is just going to be even better than the ones before so to see a group of young people from all, all our you know our, our local colleges and schools engaged in it is even better and to have an East Ender star well what can I say <laughs> <laughs> he's not known for East Ender. he's going to be known for his Shakespeare work yeah. though, isn't he? let's that's hope his, so that's the plan <laughs> and, and again the broad range of ages from Lily how old are you seven yeah. seven to who's the oldest one here 16, 16. And, uh, you know, that's the typically the 
the age range that do not like Shakespeare, yeah, yeah. and they are coming. You know, those reactions coming through the, that from that auditorium are quite remarkable. So when they see the whole show, I hope they're exactly the same. Uh, any last points, folks? Aaron, Hal? Yeah, I was just going to say, I make the theatre I make is always for like the sixteen year old dubious version of myself who's like whatever <laughs> <laughs> so i would massively encourage young people to come to this because i'm trying to please that side of myself my naughty naughtiness so um, <laughs> come and look disinterested and we'll try and prove you, prove you wrong amazing <laughs> amazing and any thoughts from you guys last before we go because once it's gone it's gone Just a little bit of a point. EastEnders is my nan's favourite show. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the day are then. Brilliant. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, this production of Henry V opens on the 22nd of May, and we cannot wait to show it to not just Sirencester, but all the surrounding areas. This is your theatre, so come down and check it out. <laughs>